Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, what I'm going to preview for you now is um, uh, basically a training website on munitions recognition and safety. Um, you'll know right off that it comes from uh, Fort Ord, California, which is a base closure site. It is part of the uh, land use controls in their remedies. They require anyone doing ground disturbing or intrusive activity within these former munitions Within these munitions response sites that have been cleaned up um, to to have uh, have done the, have gone through this training. So to make it efficient to implement it, the training was developed. It's uh, going up on a website so that a contractor going in to do work can just have their people watch the video. Um, they when they do it on the website, they'll put their name and email address in, and it'll capture that they've. Um, documenting that they've done the, the training. Um, and I think it's a good example of how you can use a training like this to educate um, people who might run the munitions on us. Um, we'll switch best thing. It's, it's not me doing the talking in the video, so that'll be a... Welcome to Munitions Recognition and Safety Training. Today you will learn the types of munitions that were used on Fort Ord. It is important to know that dangerous items may not look dangerous. This training will teach you what to do if you encounter a suspected munitions item. You will learn the steps involved in recognizing a potential munition, retreating from the found item, and reporting it to the proper authorities. This will ensure your safety and the safety of those around you. Munitions Recognition and Safety Training is for workers conducting ground disturbing activities or intrusive activities on the former Fort Ord. If you're going to be doing work on any former military training area, you need to be aware of the potential for finding munitions. Training with munitions occurred on Fort Ord for more than 75 years. Munitions are items that contain explosives, propellants, or chemical agents. Although munitions cleanup has been conducted, it is possible that munitions may not have been detected and remain present on or in the ground. It is important to be aware of potentially hazardous munitions remaining on your worksite and know how to safely react and respond if you encounter a suspected munition item. This training was produced to fulfill record of decision and land use control requirements following munitions cleanup and is part of a larger munitions risk management program required by the state of California. What you are about to learn is important to help you stay safe while working on the former Fort Ord. The former Fort Ord is located on Monterey Bay in northwestern Monterey County, California. Fort Ord has a long history of military training beginning in 1917 and at one time was the largest infantry training post in the country. Training involved the use of military munitions in a wide range of sizes, including hand grenades, rifle grenades, shoulder-fired munitions, mortars, and projectiles. Oh, I forgot to tell you, um, there are tests <laughs> along the way. So that when somebody's doing the training, they have to actually pay attention. You've taken those kind of trainings before. Um, What's the intended purpose of the training? I'm not going to read the answers, but you guys, anybody want to throw out an answer? To be effective, the military trained in realistic scenarios using weapons with live ammunition. Sometimes munitions do not work as intended. They do not function or detonate as designed after being thrown, fired, or launched. 
As a result of training, a wide variety of munitions, including unexploded ordnance, also known as UXO, have been encountered at the former Fort Ord. The Army has identified and is in the process of cleaning up former training ranges on Fort Ord. Thousands of munitions have been removed since base closure. In the 1990s, Fort Ord was selected for base realignment and closure. Subsequently, the Department of Defense closed the majority of Fort Ord, including the training ranges. The land is being returned to the community with an overall mission of reuse focused on education, economy, and the environment. Since base closure, the Army has been searching for and removing munitions. This has significantly reduced the risk of encountering munitions. Munitions cleanup is ongoing, so it is important to heed the warning signs and stay out of posted areas. Cleanup does not always remove everything. It is possible that munitions remain and will continue to be hazardous over time. To protect yourself and your family, do what the military does. Follow the three R's of explosive safety. The first R is to recognize hazards and what to do if something suspicious is encountered. The ability to recognize munitions is the first step in reducing risk. Any encounter with a known or suspected munition may be an extremely dangerous situation. Even items designed for training could be hazardous if mistreated. Munitions do not make good souvenirs, as they are potentially deadly. Taking a munition for a keepsake presents an immediate and real danger to you. Munitions are not toys. Bringing one home endangers your family, your friends, and your community. Don't be tempted. If you were to encounter any of these items, would you know which are most likely munitions? All seven are munitions, demonstrating that munitions are not easy to identify. Next, you will see more examples of the munitions that you might find on Fort Ord. Munitions come in many shapes and sizes. Not all munitions are obviously recognizable. Some could look like a piece of pipe, an old muffler, a soda can, a baseball, or a brake drum. They may look new or old and rusty. They may be found alone or in clusters, be partially covered by vegetation or soil, or be intact or in many pieces. In addition, the munition may be damaged, which presents a particular hazard because it may contain chemical agents that could cause immediate or long-term injury. Regardless of its condition, it can be hazardous. The fragmentation hand grenade is designed to detonate and kill. It can be oval or round in shape and is about the size of a pear. A person could be killed or seriously injured even 50 yards away if a hand grenade detonates. The 40 millimeter grenade can appear harmless, often tempting a person to pick it up. However, the 40 millimeter grenade is particularly dangerous and can kill many people with a single detonation. It has a highly sensitive fuse, which can detonate even with the lightest movement. Rifle grenades are propelled grenades, ranging from about 9 to 17 inches in length. Many people have never seen a rifle grenade and could mistake it for a harmless item. However, tampering with these items could result in severe injury or death. Mortars can range from 2 to 4 inches in diameter and up to 2 feet in length. After years in the ground, a rusty mortar could resemble a pipe or an automobile muffler. 
A tail fin may be all that is visible, which may not look dangerous and may tempt a person to disturb it to see what it is. Training on Fort Ord also included a variety of projectiles that can be launched from several weapons. Projectiles can range in size from the palm of your hand to the length of your arm. Projectiles can also have bands around the circumference and often resemble a large bullet. When a large projectile explodes, metal fragments travel at high speeds to distances up to 2,000 feet, the length of six and a half football fields. Anyone within this area could be severely injured or killed. The rocket launcher has evolved over time, incorporating the use of several rocket sizes. Some rocket launchers are single-shot weapons that are pre-packed with a rocket inside of the launcher. To be safe, assume there is a live rocket inside any launching tube you may find. Fired rockets may still contain residual propellant that could ignite and burn violently. Practice subcaliber rockets were often used in training. They contain components to simulate the sound, flash, and smoke of a rocket. These munitions may look like a piece of rebar after being fired and exposed to the elements. Pyrotechnics are munitions items used for signaling, illumination, or defensive countermeasures, producing a brilliant light, smoke, or intense heat, or simulating the sound of an explosion. <laughs> Pyrotechnics may not seem dangerous, however moving parts and burning components can cause serious injuries. Pyrotechnics can come in many shapes and sizes. They may look like an aluminum tube with fins, or they may look like a grenade, rocket, or projectile. If you find a suspected pyrotechnic, follow the three R's as you would with any potentially dangerous item. Munitions may contain white phosphorus, also known as WP which is a highly efficient smoke-producing agent, burning quickly and producing an instant blanket of smoke. WP begins burning when it is exposed to oxygen. It sticks to the skin and continues to burn unless deprived of oxygen, or until it is completely consumed. WP will not stop burning until it is completely submerged in water or burns itself out. Some WP munitions can ignite on their own because they are thin and can rust through with exposure. If smoke is seen in your work area, do not move towards it because it could be the sign of a white phosphorus item that has become exposed to air. Once exposed to air, the item can burst, causing WP to fly through the air and cause serious injury. If WP contacts the skin, the area should be covered in a wet cloth, wet sand, or submerged in water and seek immediate medical help. Explosive landmines were not placed on Fort Ord. Training was conducted with practice mines that contained pyrotechnics or were booby-trapped. Landmines don't look like most other munitions items and could resemble harmless debris, like a brake drum. Tampering with training landmines can cause burns or other injuries. A blasting cap is a small explosive device used to detonate a larger, more powerful explosive. They are not easily recognized as explosives, which can lead to injuries if mishandled. During this training, you have seen pictures of a variety of items so that you are aware of the types of munitions that you could encounter. Now you know that a munition item can be any shape or color and may not be easily recognized. Military munitions are designed to kill or maim people or destroy property and could remain hazardous for years. The consequences of accidentally detonating a munitions item encompasses a wide range of possible outcomes, including severe burns, bodily injury, or death. This training does not make you a munitions expert. 
It is your job to recognize the potential for munitions hazards and follow the three R's of explosive safety. Recognize, retreat, and report. This training will help you recognize when you may have encountered a munition and its potential danger. Recognition is key to reducing your risk of injury or death. Do not try to identify the name or type of munition. Because munitions pose a potential explosive hazard, they should never be touched, moved, or disturbed. Leave the area after recording or marking the general location. Record a GPS location near the item if you have the capability and take a photo of the item. Do not approach the item to get a more accurate location or a better photo. Providing as much information as possible about what you saw and where you saw it will help relocate the item. Report the find using the requirements in your work plan. Your site safety personnel will provide you with specific procedures for reporting suspect items found on your site. If you do not have a work plan, follow the Fort Ord Military Munitions 3Rs Explosive Safety Guide for reporting what you found. Specially trained personnel will return to the location to identify, evaluate, and dispose of the item. Protect yourself and your coworkers from potential munitions hazards by following the three R's. Do the right thing. So these are for areas that the munitions cleanup has been done, the property has been transferred, and the developer is going to come in and uh, build houses, put in a commercial area, that kind of thing. So this is specifically focused toward, well, it's mostly focused towards those construction workers who are going to be out on the site, moving the dirt, doing the development work after the cleanup. Um, you did see some pictures in there during the cleanup of some big piles of soil and some equipment there. That was armored equipment excavating um, soil and taking it through screening operations. Uh, mostly because we had 40 millimeter grenade ranges and those things are so sensitive that they, they couldn't risk putting people down, down range to, to dig on. So they excavated it, ran it through um, with uh, armored equipment through the whole thing. But our part was land use control implementation plan. We've got this requirement for um, munitions recognition and safety training. Um, how are we going to implement it? So we put together this this training so that it's it's out there and available. You don't have to have instructors available all the time. And I think I don't know you guys' this opinion, but I think it, it it's 20 minutes, but it goes quick. It's engaging and it has a very clear message. So. Um, Think about it as a as a resource. Um, it will be out on the web. I think it's under forwardsafety.com. It will eventually be on. Um, and if you need something for your own sites, uh, you know, plagiarism in this industry is a, a compliment, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next to the last topic um, today is. Uh, Kind of, if you're doing regulatory oversight, what are some of the considerations? This is a talk I put together specifically on when advanced geophysical classification was just coming out and it was, you guys have got some experience in this. What do you think? What should you be thinking about? Uh, but really, these are the same things you should be thinking about on any munitions project. So as I go through it, you'll see advanced geophysics in here. But think about it um, much more, much more broad terms. Um, in terms of advanced classification, um, the issue of technology acceptance and adoption, and these slides are a few years old, but um, it does work. And it works really well where it works. Um, the technology has that capability to um, identify and distinguish intact munitions items from uh, safe fragments and debris, but it's not a silver bullet. This is, I think we've talked about a lot here. It doesn't work everywhere, uh, 
And where you do use it, the way to make it work is with all of those quality issues, making sure you're doing all of the quality control and quality assurance that you need to, because that's the key to successful implementation of both advanced geophysics and, uh, and DGM and any kind of munitions cleanup work. You're doing, you're cleaning these sites up, you're digging and investigating thousands of items. It's repetitive. The only way to make sure that you're doing it well all the time is with quality systems. Um, so with that, we're focusing on you know, how do you how do you oversee the implementation? The way I look at these projects is focusing on the decision points. You're going to go out. You're going to do the work. You're going to reach a point where you've got to make a decision. What's the decision to be made? What data do you need to support making that decision? And how good a quality does that data need to be? And that goes through the whole range of decision making from we're doing the RI and we need to find the impact areas. What's the decision there is um, whether or not you know, whether or not we have an impact area, how big of an area are we looking for to decide is this an impact area or not? And more importantly, the decision that these low density areas aren't impact areas. So making sure you've got the data to support your comfort level in making those decisions. Um, classification in DGM and all of these things, I call them hands-on technology because you've got to be engaged in not just overseeing it, but understanding um, what they're doing opening up the hood and looking underneath to understand all of their assumptions and all of the things going on down at that more detailed level because those things all matter. Um, and is any project active stakeholder participation? You want everybody engaged in deciding what the items are you're looking for, um, what you're not concerned about, how hard you're going to look, what uncertainty you're going to accept. If you haven't noticed, classification is a disruptive technology. Um, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about its implementation, about where it might work, where it might not work. Um, all of these changes in quality systems. Um, basically, for our industry, this is changing how people do business day to day. When you do a change and it's disruptive like that, um, there's a lot of change going on. Um, it's changing the way they're looking at contracting. It's changing the way we're looking at state oversight. It's changing all of those things, and we'll touch every stakeholder. So um, it's out there. It's happening. How do we manage that change? Um, I look at it in dating myself, but you know, back in the '90s when I started with this stuff. Um, UXO cleanup was simply get a whole bunch of UXO techs out there with, with analog instruments, have them grid the site out, and start going. Um, a lot of UXO techs, geophysicists weren't even in the picture yet. Uh, uh, the GPS was still a military thing, and there was error built into it. So civilians, you could use it, but it wasn't accurate. Um, then that transitioned into the second generation where we started doing di digital geophysical mapping. Um, geophysicists started to come onto these projects. You've got a little different culture between a geophysicist and a UXO tech. And they had to start trying to figure out how to work together. But the projects are still UXO tech dominated. A lot of guys out in the field digging holes, um, looking for munitions. And now, going into this this third era, third generation, it's starting to be technology driven. Um, it's starting to be the geophysics and the technology and the quality component of it. And it's changing that role in the field of the UXO tech. Um, it's changing it in a couple of ways. Um, 
it's going to be a smaller UX OTEMP workforce, probably, although it may not be. But it also has to change everybody's mindset when those guys go out in the field and dig holes. Um, they're not going out in this room with 250 flags that they have to dig and one of them might be a live item. They're given a list of live items to dig on day one of the project. So if we're doing regulatory oversight, what does that mean? It means we have to make sure that we're comfortable with their health and safety plan, with their explosives plan, with how they're going to detonate live items on the first day that they start digging. Because it's not, will they find one eventually? It's if they're going to find them, they're going to find them right at the beginning. And that's that's a change in, in project execution um, and project management. Because it's not, well, once we find one, we'll put it in storage. If we find a couple more, we'll start thinking about how to, how to detonate them. It's, OK, we're going to, here's the, the first ones you're going to find. You know, be ready to deal with it. Um, it also means that their game is going to be how to gonna revert back to how do you dig dangerous items as opposed to an Easter egg hunt. Uh, most of the stuff isn't dangerous. Every now and then it gets exciting. Um, we've kind of talked about the, the cost and the complexity part of it already. Uh, so it is a change. And if you, if you think about change management in any industry and what's going on, um, there's models for that. It's uh, kind of denial, not really sure it's going to happen. Um, that change point hits, you get some resistance, and you get some pushback, and people aren't quite sure what's going to happen. And it's disruptive and it's messy because people are figuring out how to make it work. Eventually, you get to a stabilized system with the bugs worked out and everybody's comfortable with it. You get commitment and that becomes the norm. But you've got to get through that disruptive change um, component of it first. And that's, that's where we are with um, advanced geophysics. But I would say most importantly, that's where we are with quality systems. It's bigger than just the technology. It's the whole concept of quality systems for munitions cleanups. Shifting from work plans to quality assurance project plans, um, writing down what you're going to do before you do it, actually reading your work plan, reading your SOPs before you go in the field, and, um, and following them and having people actually accountable for, for doing that stuff. So. Um, that's a change, that's a transition. It's gonna be ugly for a while as it's happening. And we've got a little bit of taste of that um, over the last day and a half. We went through, or we're actually finishing up one of these projects in Colorado. Um, uh, range on uh, Lowry Bombing Range, uh, Future land use, currently cattle grazing, might build a water reservoir there, um, might put a state park around the water reservoir. Some people would love to eventually build houses there. Um, Open-handed. Um, in our lifetimes, it'll probably remain cattle grazing because the water guys can't decide on anything. Um, 57 millimeter recoilless rifle rounds were used there. Also some 37 millimeters concerned for smaller 20 millimeter. Um, our plan is to, was to execute it and pick the things that needed to be dug and leave everything else in the ground. Um, this was the first time it's been implemented like that. Um, so we weren't really sure what we were getting into. Um, start to finish demonstration. Um, part of it, the contractor used DGM to map. Part of it, they used um, the metal mapper of advanced geophysics to map it and then queue off of both of those. Um, it, it's worked. Um, they've uh, they found several live rounds. Um, they actually found most of the rounds on the surfaces they were doing the surface clearance. Um, 
we learned some things in going through it. Um, most importantly, make sure everybody's on the same page as to what you're looking for. Because looking for that versus looking for that is almost an order of magnitude difference in cost. I thought they were looking for that. Their contractor thought they were looking for that. We ended up doing a change order. Uh, but that took six months, and it took a lot of yelling and screaming that didn't need to happen. Um, so, lesson learned from, you'd think I would have learned these lessons before. Lesson learned from the classification project. Communication, communication, communication. If you have a conversation about it, and you agree on it, that's great. But until you've actually written it down, and everybody's read it, and they're all on the same page, don't assume you're on the same page. Um, I was a disbeliever in using a quap to replace a work plan, and for years pushed back hard on that. Um, they almost didn't do this project because I was like, we can't do it without a work plan. Um, but I decided, you know, let's try it. Let's see. And I have to say, um, the quap that they ultimately produced was a very effective tool to use as a work plan. Uh, so, I'm now a believer that you can use a QAP in the structure of the QAP and all those crazy worksheets, um, and at the end of the day, you get a really good work plan. Because you've got an appendices that's got all of their SOPs in it and how they're going to do all of that work, and you've got a structure behind it um, to force them to ask and answer the right questions. Um, so, I'm a, I'm a convert on that. Um, it's great at identifying your data quality objectives, and it's great at forcing your contractors to think through their SOPs and think through how they're going to do the work before they go in the field. Then you just have to remind them when they go in the field that they need to change it, that they need to come back around and do a change, uh, a change to their platform and, and keep it all, keep it all tight. Um, our team had some failures in the field. They missed some uh, some QC and, and a QA C. Um, the field team went rogue. They uh, um, the, the grids on the edge of our cleanup area transitioned from prairie down into a riparian area where they couldn't. Um, it's basically a stream bed, and so. They couldn't get DGM um, coverage in there, and they had an SOP for mine and fiducial. They just didn't put grid stakes on all four corners. They approximated. Well, that's not in their SOP. That's Somebody in the field thought that was a good idea, and so they just went out and did it. All right, the quality system kicked in, and it caught it, and unfortunately, the, the catch was a QA grid, and they learned the lesson of what does it mean to, to miss a QA. And it was, you missed a QA seed, stop work, pull everybody out of the field until you bound the problem. Now this freaked out the contractor, right? They've got 30, 40 people working all over the site, and they're like, well, we failed over here. Why do we need to stop over here? It's like, you stop everybody until you can prove that the problem is only over here. If you can do that in two hours, great. Do that in two hours. So they're like, they quickly realized that the problem had to do with this riparian area. So we said, all right, just stop work in that area until we go through the full root cause analysis there. Um, anybody here of the five whys? When you do root cause analysis, it's, why did you miss that seed? Well, I missed that seed because my flag was here and the seed was there. Why was the flag in the wrong place? Um, the flag was in the wrong place because our line of fiducials were off of this corner instead of that corner. Well, why was that? Why was that? Why was that? When you ask down to about that fifth Y, you've taken it down to 
the true root cause. In this case, the root cause wasn't that they did line of fiducials wrong. The root cause was that their field crew wasn't properly trained that you follow your procedure, and if your procedure won't work, you stop and you change your procedure. So it's getting down to actually what the root cause of the problem is, not just fixing the symptoms. Did you guys do uh, post removal verification on that? Um, we have not, and we're debating right now whether that's something that we need to do on that project. What would you do? Well, how's the record there? I push for Good answer. Um, I cheated and used this, this slide in the earlier parts of it so people are, are paying attention. Um, what are some of the keys to, to getting regulatory acceptance of this stuff? Um, beginning at the beginning, getting everybody's agreement, conceptual design before your contractor is there, right? So that um, when the contractor comes in, it's a team of um, the, the Corps or the Navy, um, the state and the contractor are all working towards the same problem and you're not starting off day one fighting about um, scope and money. Um, make sure you have clear remedial action objectives. Our biggest issue out here was our remedial action objective was written that you have to be able to detect all of the munitions and a threshold based on a 37 millimeter round at, I want to say, 10 inches. Yeah. Um, well, the reason that was picked as a 37 millimeter at 10 inches was that if you had a 20, 20 millimeter round, you would find it at 5 inches. The objective wasn't to find 37s, the objective was to find all of them. But if you didn't know that from being on the project site, and you bid on it to, to do classification on 37s, you were bidding on a different problem than we thought you were. Um, and that was, that was probably six months of arguing over just not writing down that whole remedial action agenda. Um, so if you're doing a removal action, make sure you write down all of the things you're looking for and the depths of interest you're looking for them so that there aren't any surprises. Seems like common sense. Um, you have to be able to detect before you classify. We, we covered that. Um, have the discussions at the work permit level about those verification and validation digs. Not only how many you're going to do, but when you're going to do them. Are you going to be doing them incrementally as you go through the project, or are you going to do them all at once? Um, you can do it either way. Depends upon how the contractor is, is setting up their um, their field implementation. But you got to think through that. How many of them are you going to do? Um, are you going to stay with 200? Or are you going to ask for more or less? And if so, what's your reasoning? Um, and who's going to check them? When you pick those 200 random targets to go out and look at, and you're going to dig them up and they're going to say do this nice report, who's going to look at that report to give a, an agree or a disagree on the findings? Because if, if they do a validation and they do a report and nobody looks at it, did you really do a validation? Um, quality systems are the key to all of this. This is this is all new. Um, accreditation has come in. The accreditation was just being developed when I put these slides together, but we have an accreditation program stood up for using advanced geophysical classification. Um, I explain it to people as it's very similar to when you take a water sample or a soil sample and you send it to a laboratory. Those are um, accredited environmental laboratories and you trust that the answer that comes back to them from them is accurate 
because they've got that accreditation and they've got those quality systems behind it. Um, it it's the same model, it's the same same standard. Same standard. And that's, that's the model that they're working under is these are environmental decisions, they've got to be legally defensible, and the way to get to that is the same model as the analytical laboratories. Um, when you think about that, that means that's a lot different than that generation one, let's get a bunch of guys out there and let's swing sticks and let's dig it up and put it in a bucket and call it good. Big change, right? Um, the, the QAP template is a template. It's something to be filled out. It is not a tutorial. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you the first time a contractor attempts to write a QAP under that template, you're going to get a piece of junk. They are going to come up with the most interesting way to take the work plan that they've always used and shoehorn it into those worksheets. And I've had, uh, worksheet 17 is supposed to be your, your design, and I've had them literally just take their work plan and put worksheet 17 on the top. <laughs> uh, data quality objectives, they're not used to doing big picture data quality objectives, so have some patience and work with them. Once they get one of them that's good, it's not hard to transition it from project to project, but this is a change, it's disruptive, and it takes some work working with them, probably a couple of extra planning meetings to get these things to where they need to be. Once they're there, they're very powerful tools. Um, I, I can't stress accreditation is a game changer anymore, but it's a game changer. I, I would predict that it's going to move from having accredited contractors just for advanced geophysics to having accredited contractors doing this work. It doesn't make sense to me that you would have a separate quality standard for one type of work and not the other. Um, so I can see that evolving further. Um, baby steps, get industry comfortable that um, accreditation is not the end of the world and that they can work under it and still be successful and then those people who are accredited are going to be, be demanding that they compete on a level playing field for the rest of the work. And so I see them, I see the industry pushing this to expand as much as anybody else. A little bit on classification decision points. Um, quick review I mean, of, of what uh, they've talked about. Um, it's not a black box. Um, the analysis and the decision making is there. It should be transparent. If you're on these projects, ask the questions. You don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be able to run the software. They should be able to walk you through all of the things they're doing and explain it to you. And it should make logical sense. Uh, Make sure that those decision points are transparent and that you're engaged in them. Um, what's the big decision point with classification? Dig threshold. What's the big decision point before you ever get to classification? Detection threshold. You have to detect before you can classify. So you've got that sensor response curve where you're deciding where's my noise, what munitions am I looking for? What threshold should I set for my geophysics to decide what a targeted anomaly is so that I can then either dig it up or classify it? Make sure you know what that decision point is and what that threshold is and why it was set the way it was because that's just as important as making sure that the classification is done correctly. If you miss it at detection, you're never going to classify it. Um, and verification validation strategy, um, those 200 seeds, um, yeah, right? 200 is a great number that somebody threw out a couple years ago and it's stuck. Um, but it's, so far it's working. 
Dave's a philosopher, and so I, I like to keep this in here. Um, when you're doing verification validation, and I, I apologize, it's down at the bottom, uh, and you're looking at checking those decisions, it's not that they made the right decision. It's very much, has anybody ever done anything with Aristotle in um, this whole philosophy? Um, it's not that you're doing the right thing that gets you credit. It's that you're doing the right thing for the right reason. Classification. It's not that you classified it right that gets you credit. It's that you classified it correctly for the correct reason. Um, why is that important when you're doing verification validation? It's the same reason why you can't randomly look for back items. If you're trying to go out there and find that one time that they made a mistake, virtually impossible to do. But to check that each time they made a decision, they made that decision correctly, you can verify each one of those and build up confidence that they're making decisions correctly for the right reason. Done? I think that covered all of this. I mean, um, this was a talk for um, state project management, like supervisory people. So I needed to beat it in and beat it in and beat it in. Um, but you guys have been hearing this for the last couple of days. Um, demand the good design. Demand that. They implement that design as written. If they need a change, change is good, but write it down before you do it. Um, I will say this is a this is a big game changer, and this is something that um, a lot of people in this industry aren't used to. Um, if you miss a QC, a QC seed, quality control seed, that's okay. The quality control seeds are out there to check the process so that if there is an issue, you can catch it and you can correct it. So you start to worry if they're never missing quality control seeds because you're not sure if their quality control system is is tight enough, if they're, if they're monitoring close enough. Um, you want to make sure if their if they're quality control issues are popping up, they're being corrected and documented and they're learning and moving on. If they miss a QA seed, that means that their quality control system failed. That's a big deal. Um, in the old paradigm, they used to say the C standing for contractor and the A standing for government. The government put in the A seeds and the contractor put in the C seeds, and it really didn't matter which one it was, if you found one, blamed it on operator error and you moved on. <laughs> um, now it's, it's a big deal. If you miss a QAC, um, you have to report it to the accreditation body and the quality oversight gods, they're looking at this stuff because they want quality systems for the industry to improve. So if you're the contract, if your contractor's out there and they miss a QAC and they put a lesson learned, that lesson learned goes out to the industry so that everybody can learn from it. These contractors don't like being told <laughs> that they messed up. They really aren't going to like having to share that with all of industry. But if you think about it, what's the best way to improve how this stuff is done? What's the quickest way to get that messy transition? Everybody learning from everybody else's mistakes. Um, so that's a big deal. And doing true root cause analysis is a big deal too, because if they miss a QAC, you got to do the root cause analysis. That root cause analysis gets published with the QAC mix, miss. So that contractor's name is on what happened and how smart they are about figuring out the correct answer. And until the corrective action is successful. And no, is that what if they want to do work at risk, their own risk? They want to go out even if you don't. We don't allow that. Huh? There is not in. Yeah, it's a quality system. Right. Right. You know it's broken. You don't know why it's broken. 
you, you stop and figure it out. And you make the corrections before you do anything else. And you can imagine the pushback because um, that can get really expensive. Right? Particularly if you have a group that doesn't know how to do root cause analysis. Yeah. I mean, a good contractor, if they miss a QAC, um, they're going to pull the fire alarm and they're going to have their top people going 24-7 until they figure out root cause and get it fixed because they're, they're burning dollars just uh, in standby. Um, now, if they're smart, the first thing they're going to do is bound the problem down to a point where they can manage those resources and they can put their people to work in the things if you're comfortable with still working properly. You know, there's a lot of things going on on the site. On our site, we're down in the riparian area, and we know that their um, their line of fiducials wasn't working. But they've got areas up where we know it's working, and they've got a lot of stuff that they need to dig. So go do that work while you figure this out. Um, but still, the first two days, they were just they were just stopped until they figured that out. Um, and I was a surprise to them. They had never had um, the Corps of Engineers actually hold them to that. They were like, well, can't we work at risk? And it's like, no. <laughs> so what's the state's role in all of this? Um, how, do we, how do we play in it? Um, what's, the, what's the focus? What are we trying to do? Um, Remedial design. Um, we need to make sure that in in a cleanup in the design, especially if they're going to do classification, we need to make sure they can both detect and classify. We need to make sure we're comfortable with their approach is going to work for that. Um, that they're checking the noise. That they're um, to, they're proposing a system that they can actually get out in the field. Um, for Hawaii, that's that's probably the biggest challenge right there. Is do they have a design that we think can work? Um, confirming that everybody's on the same page for the munition of interest for the site and the depth profile for those items. Um, are we looking for a one five five to a foot or two feet or ten feet? Um, makes a difference. I don't know. What are you guys looking for down here? Thirty six. 36 inches for 36 feet? 36 inches. 36, okay. yeah. um, pay attention to the quap. Get comfortable reviewing and reading these quaps and identify the those important pieces to make sure that the project's fully documented. They should have a table that shows all the features of work they're going to do and all the SOPs for doing that work. Thumb through it. Read the SOPs, make sure that they connect the dots, that you can actually do all of this work in the SOPs they say they can. Um, you don't have to get down too much into their laundry as far as um, who's going to do what and all of that and the details of their SOPs, but make sure they make sense and that they're complete uh, when you're reviewing those work plans. Um, decision points, decision points, decision points. That quap is going to have. Um, 10 or 11 EQOs, 10. Is the, the, the which, which worksheet? The worksheet 12 or 11, the greater the EQOs is the Okay, worksheet 11, data quality objectives. And I'm terrible about memorizing the numbers, but that seven step process, that's going to have your decision points in it. And it's going to say, this is the decision we're going to make, this is the data we're going to use to make that decision. Make sure you're comfortable that that's the decision you that's the decision you want to be made. That's that's the right decision point. Make sure you're comfortable that if it says if this is what we find, this is what we're going to do, that you're comfortable with that. Because it's a two-way street on this whole thing. The only way these claps work is if not only do they implement it as written, but if um, in the regulatory oversight part. If we're also comfortable that if you implement it as written, it'll get us all to where we think we need to be. 
Now you've got that worksheet 37 where you're going to do your data usability part to give you a back check on that. But make sure you're comfortable up front that with how those decisions are going to be made and the data to be used for. Um, and that you're going to check it and validate it. Um, big piece I see is in um, how do states do independent oversight of this work. Um, Yoxo Analyze is Oasis Montage, that data, or that program is not an easy program to use. Um, it's expensive to have a license to. Um, it's pretty specialized. It's getting better to use. Um, but it's, it's not something that you would expect um, any project manager for the state or the core to be able to pick up and use. Yet that's the tool being used to make these decisions. So when we're doing oversight, how do we ver how do we make sure that that tool is being used properly? Um, how do we check the checkers of the checkers? Um, and a lot of states are looking at it and going, we're we're going to hire, we're going to bring in technical experts to specifically help us do this. Um, I've used technical experts to say, here's my 200 validation digs. You take them and you take the raw data and you cross-check it and make sure that um, everything's legit. Um, so I think there's a lot of, with all this high-tech stuff, there's a, definitely a need for independent experts to come in and do this stuff. The Army Corps of Engineers is looking at uh, um, contracting their own third-party technical experts to come in over the top and help them with oversight of these projects. because They don't have the in-house technical resources to do all the data day stuff either. So that's another change that's going on. So what are the challenges? Um, for technical project managers like us, training. This is all new, this is all high tech, it's changing a lot. I mean, you guys are jumping way forward. <coughs> Um, over the last two days and being aware of all this stuff going on, um, getting training on QAPS, um, getting training on this risk assessment methodology if, it's, if it takes hold and it goes forward, um, getting the training, getting the specific training on the on VSP. I showed you enough to make you guys dangerous enough to really ask the right questions, but there's training that can help you to um, take it to the next level and be doing your own conceptual designs and going into these meetings and really being able to have a conversation. Um, so how do you get how do you get uh, project managers all trained up for this? I know the, the Corps of Engineers and probably the Navy is struggling with the same thing for their project managers because everybody is changing for everybody. Um, and then how do we collaborate to share lessons learned in doing the oversight? And in what works and what doesn't work. Um, yeah, and technical guidance, or is guidance coming out on this stuff? The, the QAP templates are coming out. Um, ITRC is working on, everybody know who ITRC is? Anybody? A couple of you. Um, State-led groups working on um, innovative technology and writing guidances guidance documents and trainings um, as technologies evolve. So it's getting, getting information out to everybody to understand the technology, the way it's being used, the best practices, all that stuff. So that's my soapbox on regulatory oversight for all of this stuff. Um, any questions? We've got about 30 minutes on munitions constituents, kind of the, the 101 basics on what are they, where they might end up on your ranges, and how to sample for them. Um, that will probably take us to about 2.30, 2.40, and then uh, we should be done. So. Oh, I was just going to say, <laughs> when we're done with questions. I, I have a question about my um, 
I'm at GGM University. Um, so we discussed that basically the safety knowledge. And I mean, well, the gate you see requires a newer sensor, but it's right. EMI technology. Right. And well, yes, or they can do it dynamic. Or but detection, like standard DGM is an older technology. Okay, right. So if you're using DGM or you're using the AGC technology during your, your suite, right. um, you're, you're going to find all these technologies. Or you should. You should find all the technologies. Now, there's, there's sometimes there's slight differences between the systems, but um, generally they have the same protection models. And the differences occur kind of in the noise, not in things like the final or the maximum reliable depth of detection. Differences from there up. So, so, don't so, so if it's determined oh, that it's more cost effective to just take all the analogies, then there's no need for agencies. Uh, well, there, you do get the collateral benefits of knowing what you should have pulled up the whole. But you have to balance that with the cost. But if they pulled 100% of the items out of the whole, they would know, right? Well, no, sometimes they don't pull 100%. Yeah, and they don't, you do they don't do the whole property. Like, yeah. I guess, like, the thing that's really open my eyes is that we've done DGM for years, we've done analog for years, but nothing's been built around quality like AGC has. And it, it makes it transparent to where, even from the core, I can see where the process is breaking down. Whereas with the other technologies, we're relying on the contractors telling us and us essentially taking their word for it a lot of times. You can't watch that process from start to finish, where with AGC, you can. It should be very transparent. It should be very it should be transparent. As transparent as you want. Yeah, but I think that would be a huge benefit for us, is that we can really keep on track. We can know where it's going wrong, actually. But, but if everything goes right, if your EM61 is fully able to detect the item of interest, and you map the area properly with the right quality, and you dig all of the anomalies, you should end up in the same place as if you used AGC and you queued it, and you only dug the ones that it told you to do. So both of them should get you to the same place in terms of cleaning the site up, but they are different processes um, with different quality issues. All right, so let's take a seven minute break.